Are there any lessons that you took away from the construction sites we saw in Switzerland that that you want to use on any future projects in the States? Yeah, whether or not I can because can. of product availability, <laughs> that's a, another question. And also code compliance. The The biggest thing uh, that was interesting to me is seeing how vapor open their wall assemblies are. Absolutely. Yeah, is, they didn't. we didn't even see any vapor barriers being used on certain sites. Which in a cold climate, that's great. Yeah. You shouldn't have any vapor barriers in a cold climate unless you're doing all exterior insulation. Um, yeah, they, the one that really struck me was uh, one of the multifamilies that we went to where it was essentially like a two by 10 construction. The exterior of the building was uh, rigid mineral uh, wool insulation boards, which were tongue and grooved, and then a rain screen cavity outboard of that. There was no structural sheathing. There was no weather resistive barrier there. Uh, <laughs> my mind just exploded when I saw that. I'm like, how are they doing this? Uh, and the way they were doing it is, is they were handling the structure of the building, the lateral racking and resistance and the structural needs of the building, but in, in the core in the of core, the structure. Yes. Yeah. So it wasn't so relying the, on the exterior walls. Those exterior walls had no real input as far as shear values or diaphragm strength or any of that goes. Uh, and then what that means is they can have this wall, which was, uh, gypsum board is an air barrier, the framing cavity full of mineral wool, and then this two inches of rigid mineral wool board on the outside. It's a total flow through assembly from a vapor perspective. Uh, the reason I like those assemblies is, is uh, I'm from New England. We are surrounded by buildings that are 200, 250 years old. I, I cut my teeth in the beginning of my career is working in buildings like that. And the reason those buildings lasted so long is because is they were able to dry out. Now, everybody says a building needs to breathe. The building doesn't need to breathe. The building needs to be able to dry. The reason those buildings lasted so long is because we would kiln dry them every winter by firing up the coal furnace or the oil boiler or the fireplaces or whatever, and they were dried out. Um, so if we're trying to make buildings that have any chance of lasting 200 years, but we have so throttled the, the energy flow through them by reducing the thermal flow through them, the vapor flow through them, the air movement through them. We don't have those energy mechanisms to dry the assembly out anymore. We have to make assemblies that can dry just due to the nature of their construction very easily. And so what that means is we need assemblies that are very vapor open and can, uh, you know, if there's any vapor loading from cooking and bathing during the winter time, running that sauna or the fish tank in the house, and that gets into your wall assembly, or heaven forbid, we have a failure of a flashing, which will inevitably happen over the lifetime of the building at some point, and there's water in the assembly, it needs to be able to have a mechanism to dry out. And that's what they're doing. They're creating these assemblies that are airtight, but incredibly vapor open. So